the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I need God, so you might as well remain standing. Let's go before the Lord. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. We're a grateful people, Father, as we gather tonight. Just a small group of us tonight, Lord, but it doesn't matter. We're, we're grateful to be in the house of the Lord. We're thankful, Father, that we haven't come to hear from a man. We haven't come to hear from a woman. We haven't come to hear from a white man, black man, tall man, short man, old man, young man. We haven't come to hear from a brown man. We haven't come to hear from, except from the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you're the teacher of the church. We want to hear what you have to say tonight. Here's our heart, fill it with your ways, your want, your will, your desire, your plan for our lives. We'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. Bless all the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are brothers, there are, there are sisters, and we respect and love them also, Lord. Because there's only one kingdom to build, and that's not a man's. It's just yours, and we're all in this to build your kingdom. We'll give you the praise, give you the glory, give you all the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say amen. amen. Go ahead, take your seat, get your Bible, and go with me to Psalms 23. When you open up your Bible, one of the great Psalms in the Bible is Psalms 23. David writes this. The neat thing about it, as we look at Psalms 23 tonight, David is a special man. As I've said so many times before you in the past, the greatest king Israel's ever known. Doubled the boundaries of Israel, brought prosperity in the land. Commerce have never been higher, greater. Economics have never been better. The people had gotten blessed by God because he served God led the people in great and mighty victories over and over again. When his son Solomon was giving into the kingdom of God to build, if you will, the house of God, David was the greatest contributor there was. He's the one that started it all off. He would have been, if you will, the Bill Gates of that day. Noted numerous times in scripture as being called after a man after God's own heart, can you imagine that God would look at you and say these words, just a man or a woman after God's own heart? What a great title that is. Not great king, not great just a wonderful person, not just a, you know, a mighty savior of the people of Israel, great combatant uh, individual who fought diligently and was one who is magnificent in the things that he did. Of course, he made a lot of mistakes too, David did. That's one of the things we can all identify with. But the great thing about David is he had a heart for God. And his heart was just for whatever God had, that's what he wanted. And when he writes this psalm, it just really says a lot about where David's at. Now, I want you to hear what I'm going to say to you. I don't get a chance to say this in my Bible college class. <clears throat> We talk about the heart in my Bible college class. We use David as an example. But there's so many examples in Scripture, I can't use them all. So I just decided to use this one for you. One of the neat things about David is you can look at his life and see his heart. Just as simple as that. Yeah, there's horrible mistakes that he made. But you'll find that he never made the same mistakes twice. He learned a lesson, made his mistakes. You know, he didn't have somebody with the Bible there telling him what to do and how to do it. He found himself often times where he was uh, making mistakes, but he's clearly a great man of God that served God in a great way. And when you read the things that he writes, you can see the penetration of the Spirit of God into his lifestyle. Sometimes I read these things and I fall personally short. It's frustrating to me to look at something like that and say, gee, in that area, I let down all the time. I think we all do. 
So as we look at Psalms 23, there's six verses that are just dynamic about really having confidence in our shepherd. His name is Jesus, by the way. And today you had to get up and have confidence in him to get going. <clears throat> Tomorrow you're going to have to have confidence in him to keep going. Next week you're going to have to have confidence in him to believe. Whatever it is, you're going to have a confidence problem if you don't realize how your shepherd, and how important your shepherd is. Psalms 23 says these words. <clears throat> the Lord is my shepherd. And I just want to stop there for a moment. I could probably go a week just on that verse. A lot of times we say the Lord is our Lord and Savior. The Lord is wonderful to us. He's my Lord. But David makes a statement about God. <coughs> Excuse me. And the statement he makes is that he's the shepherd. That refers to a couple of things. One, he's the sheep. David. Number two, he follows a shepherd. I wonder how many of us could come along and make that statement. We know Jesus to be Lord and Savior. We proclaim him the king of our life, boss of our life. But I wonder how many of us come along and make the statement that he's really the shepherd of our life. He really leads us where we need to go and be what he needs us to be. Watches over us and protects us. A shepherd is different than just the Lord of your life. He's one who's directly involved in your life, in every area of your life, protecting everything that you are, building everything you'll ever be, helping you to realize and see the things that you need to see. The Lord, he says, is my shepherd. You don't go any further tonight. You and I ought to get to a place of at least realizing that we are sheep and we need a shepherd. And the shepherd is Jesus. In fact, we need to know him so well and have him so lead us and so protect us, minister to us, that we can make a statement like he makes in this verse. I shall not want. That's a powerful statement. See, we want something all the time because he's not our shepherd. He's our Lord because we've been taught to say that. <clears throat> yeah, can you give me a little bit of water there, Debbie? Thanks. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. He's our Lord because we've been taught to say that, but he's not really our shepherd. He's not really one who's out in front of us and taking care of and protecting us, and we have full confidence in him to the place where we don't want anything. We're constantly in want because we're constantly got our eyes off of him. And that's a sad thing for all of us, including me. I find myself, when I'm frustrated about the day, it's because I simply have got my eyes off my shepherd. And I've got my eyes back on the problems of the day. I've got my eyes on my condition instead of his condition. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Verse number two comes along and says these words. <clears throat> Excuse me. He makes me to lie down. Green pastures. Green pastures means good spots. We have a tendency to always be out of sync with God, so we ended up in the wrong places all the time. 
A green pasture is a place where we get to graze all the time and the food is great. The place is comfortable. The place is safe. It's an ideal spot for a sheep to be in. It's not a withered pasture. Have you ever noticed Christians that because they don't make him their shepherd, they find themselves in the wilderness all the time. There's no feed, there's no, there's no, there's no life. And God wants to take us to a place where there's a place of life. And the word makes there is an interesting word, isn't it? He, because I so trust him and made him my shepherd, and that I shall not want, he has the right to make me do something. He can get me out of that starving area, get me out of that desert land, which I don't know why, but we have a tendency to go to. That's the, the goofiness of this world and the flesh that runs us. There's no feed there. There's no fulfillment there. There's no life there. But we always have a tendency to run to the wrong places. And God says he makes us. But I like this. To lie down. Lie down means come to me, you are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And he makes me to go to the green pastures where there's life, but he also, in those green pastures, they're so full of life that I can rest Amen. and lie down, all because he's my shepherd. You go through the day and you know, your boss is on you and the problems are on you. Pink slips come, pink slips go. Life is full of all kinds of problems every day, and you know it. Cars don't start right. Flat tires out of the blue. Gas prices went up again. What's that all about? Seems like the people in the world, they never have any problems. They just kind of go through all of it. But we that are Christians always seem to have some problems. And we shouldn't be having these problems because we've got a shepherd who's going to make us lie down in a fertile place full of good food, good feet. Why? Because he wants to take care of you. When you have problems during the day and the boss is on you and finances don't go the way they ought to, life is boring. doesn't mean that God doesn't want to take care of you. <clears throat> God really wants to take care of you. He says he makes me to lie down in green pastures and then he says he leads me beside still water. <clears throat> Interesting thing about still water, it's like distilled where all the sediment of the water, all the filth of the water, all the dirt, all the garbage is now settled to the bottom. Still water means up at the top is the best water to drink. It's already been naturally purified. And distilled water is a water that has all the impurities that have been sit still for a while and it is settled to the bottom. And the best water that you can drink is one that you are led to that is, we have a tendency to drink all kinds of junk. We'll settle for anything. And yet he comes along and he makes this statement, and it's a powerful statement. He leads me beside still waters. Wow. So he's going to take me someplace, and I'm okay with that. I shall, shall not want. Because the water is so smooth, so clear. Verse number three comes along and he makes a statement to those that are his shepherd. <clears throat> he restores my soul. When the world has beat the snot out of you, you need something to help you. 
when your friends have let you down, the promises they made never came to pass, the promises they were given to you never happened, life just seems to not function well. He restores the soul. Brings you back to a place of sound mind. God says he hasn't given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. You have the mind of Christ. God says this statement, it's an powerful statement. He makes a statement that comes along and says this, that you'll live by the wisdom of God, not the vanity of man. You cannot do that till your soul is restored. Restoring the soul means you can now see what is right and you can now see what is really wrong. And it doesn't matter what people say, it matters what God says. And you can determine the difference between what is of God and what isn't of God. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Ever thought about that? Why? On the path of righteousness is blessings. Off the path of righteousness is cursings. And he will lead you to the right path. The path of the shepherd. The Bible says that the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. That means if you're washed by the blood, God wants to order your steps. Wants to take you someplace where you didn't even think you could go. Be what you never thought you could be. Say what you never thought you could say. In other words, he wants to take you and lead you to the path of righteousness, but it says for his name's sake. So you'd be a witness to a lost and dying world of the goodness of God. It's a powerful thought, but this is where David was at that made him so incredible. He faced the days and the problems and the trials of life knowing that he had a shepherd that cared about him. Most of us have heard that, but it really hasn't fallen down into our hearts. He cares so much about us, he wants to lead us on the path of his righteousness so that we can be blessed, so we can be a witness to a lost and dying generation. And then he comes along and he covers in verse number four, there's going to be some problems. For though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, man, you're going to walk through it. There'll be some trials, problems, and temptations in life. There's going to be situations that are going to come that are going to stink, and you're not going to be able to figure them out. But it doesn't matter. You've got a shepherd on your side. It doesn't matter because he's there to take care of you, to provide for you, to bring you to the green pastures, to bring you to the still waters, to bring you to the path of righteousness. He's your shepherd. He cares about you more than you care about yourself. For though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, then he comes along and he makes this statement. There's no devil in hell going to prosper about me. He says, I will fear no evil. Why? Because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. In other words, you've got God on the inside of you. You're wall to wall. Holy Spirit. The devil can just go take a flying jump at a galloping ghost. He used to play with you, but he doesn't anymore. Now you tell him to get out of your life and get going. You don't have to put up with it. You're not a pawn to the devil any longer, and you don't have to fear the cursings of men because you cannot curse what's blessed. <laughs> David knew it, my friends. And then he comes along and he makes his, your rod and your staff, they shall comfort me. Oh, that's the craziest statement in the world. Rod and staff weren't for comfort. They were for correction. But did you know after you've been corrected and you're on the right path, that kind of brings comfort? <clears throat> and 
In other words, God's going to hit you in the head if he has to with his rod and his staff to get you on the right track path. That brings us to comfort. Care so much about us that he'll give us a little boot here and there. Make sure that we don't fall into these traps that we so easily beseech us. And his little rod will just make sure and his little staff is there to comfort you. But you know, the rod and staff was also there as a weapon that fought off evil. And the closer that you are as a sheep to the shepherd, the less likely the wolves on the outside would get to you. Because before a wolf came and got you, they'd have to go through the shepherd's rod and staff. A lot of people fail as Christians because they don't stay very close to the shepherd. The ones that prosper the most and are the most comfortable are the ones, if you will, that stay close to him. See, that's your call. I can't do that. I can't make that happen for anybody. How close will you stay to the shepherd's rod? Now, the rod go two ways, give you a bump on the butt, but guess what? It'll also knock the wolf out. And sometimes I need them both. Because I make mistakes or I need God to correct me so that I can be comforted. But I also need God to protect me with his rod so that the wolf doesn't get me in my foolishness until I learn how to get back on the path of righteousness. David knew that. That's why he was so great. He says this in verse number five, you have prepared a table before me. In other words, God wants to just prosper you like crazy. Preparing a table is like abundance. A lot of people don't know that, but that's what that's really all about. He wants you to be abundant in every area of your life. Jesus makes a statement. I didn't. Jesus makes a statement. I have come to give you life and give it how? Finish it more abundant. You make all grace abound towards me that I always have all sufficiency in all things and have a what? An abundance for every good work. He's the God of the abundance. He brings them into the promised land. Before he brings them in, he shows them what it's going to be like. There wasn't a little bit in that promise to the promised land. They were gigantic fruit, gigantic vegetables, gigantic everything. It was a real promised land. It was a land of green pastures. And this table he just builds and gives, but he does it in front of your enemies. The ones that called your names, laughed at you. Ones that didn't think much of you thought you were a fool. The ones who didn't keep their promises to go on with Jesus. They'll watch as you feast. He anoints my head with oil. When the sheep had their head anointed, they were anointed with an oil that kept all of the flies out of their eyes. That's what the anointing's all about in the oil. That means all the little bugs and all the little problems. He'll anoint your head with oil. So that all of these things won't get in your eyes and ears and run your life and make you crazy. Man, he thinks of everything, doesn't he? Comes along, makes this statement. My cup runs over. David, did he have problems? Yeah. Did he have life's failures? Yes. Did he lose children? Yes. Was he heavy hearted over it? Yes. 
But his answer goes, my cup runs over. Why? Because of the shepherd. See, that's what made him so special. And then he says, surely, goodness and mercy follows me all the days of my life. Everywhere he went, there's goodness. Everywhere he went, there's mercy. Wherever he went, goodness followed him. Wherever he went, mercy followed him. He knew that. There's mercy. There's goodness. How do you fail when you've got this kind of an attitude about your God? Simple six verses. Listen closely. How do you fail in business? How do you fail in marriage? How do you fail in your life, in your personality? How do you live a crazy life of depression and discouragement and frustration when you know without a shadow of a doubt wherever you go, goodness and mercy is following you? I don't have to look for goodness and mercy. I know they're right there. Following me everywhere. All hell is breaking against you. All trouble wants to come and stop you. Everybody wants to accuse you. Everybody wants to beat you up. Everyone wants to take from you. Goodness and mercy follows you. You have that kind of an attitude. Man, I'm talking. How do you miss? And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How about that? What an attitude. You say, well, I don't live in a very good place today. Who cares? You got one coming, man. It's going to be great. <laughs> He'll improve the one you're in today by having the attitude of him being your shepherd. Remember what he started off with? Lord is my shepherd and I shall not what? This is what I suggest. These verses are fun verses, but they're no good in a book, but they're powerful in your heart. Somehow you've got to take them out of the book and put them in your heart. They meant so much to David that he wrote about them. And if we can get them out of the book and get them into our heart and in our mouth throughout the day, it'll change the world we live in. My friends, David was great, but he did not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus has not washed his blood away when he was king of Israel, or excuse me, his sins away. He did not have a relationship that you have today. How much greater could you and I be if we just took this attitude on it? The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want, period. I'm finished. Let's get right with God. Some of you need to give your heart and life to Jesus in the air. And tonight is your night, just as simple as that. Listen, let's just cut through all the stuff. You cannot get to heaven on your own with your own ideologies and your own philosophy. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. You can't get there any other way except his way. Then he comes along and tells us in Scripture, what is his way? John 3rd chapter, he says, you must be born again. Must be born again. Now, most people that attend American churches on a regular basis, that means once a week. Did you know that most of them don't really know what born again means? Most people, isn't that a tragedy? 
Here's what born again means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. It means you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been. Always will be. All or nothing. I'll prove it to you. Now listen to what I'm going to say to you. I'll prove it to you. It's all or nothing. Last book in the Bible, you've heard about it, the book of Revelation. Jesus himself is speaking. He says, when I come, and you know he is, he says, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Did you know what he just really said? People that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all. And they're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. Wow, wait a minute. What's lukewarm? Let me define it for you. A little in, a little out. A little up, a little down, token prayer, occasional church attendance. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. God is something in your life. Oh yeah, he's something. But he's not everything. He's just something right along with everything else. And until you make him everything, he'll never be something, by the way. So today is your day of salvation. You know who Jesus is in your head. You celebrated Christmas and Easter every year of your life. There's no doubt about it. But did you know that head knowledge about who Jesus is won't get you to heaven? No, no. Because you know who Jesus is doesn't make you a Christian. Think about it. The devil knows who Jesus is. He's not a Christian going to heaven. So we all know who Jesus is. The question is not what's in your head. The question is what have you done with your heart? You say, wait a minute, Pastor. I thought because I'm a pretty good person, I get to go to heaven. I thought, Pastor, because, uh, you know, I love God, I get to go to heaven. I thought because I'm a nice person, I get to go to heaven. Or I give my money to charity. Or I'm not a problem child. Or a person that causes trouble. I just get along with everybody in society. Surely that'll get me to heaven, won't it? Nope, it will not. Wait a minute, my mom and dad, Pastor, told me I was a Christian when I was a kid. They said, hey, that, uh, you know, you've been, they took me and had me christened or baptized when I was a baby put a cross or a St. Christopher around my neck when I was a child. Oh, I'm glad they did, but guess what? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that'll get you to heaven. The only way to get to heaven, Jesus says it himself, you must be born again. And in order for you to be born again, listen to this, in order for you to be born again, you're going to have to make the effort to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been. God forgive us in American churches for 250 years. We've watered this down because we're afraid of the faces of people. Always will be. And somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're going to have to give God what he went to the cross and paid for. All of your heart and all of your life. And you got to give it to him because he's not a thief to rob it from you. It's your heart, your life. He's not a conniver to make you do it. He's not a manipulator to make you do it. He's not going to hit you in the head with a two by four and say, now I'm going to keep hitting you in the head until you give your heart and life to me. He doesn't do that. The choice is yours. The call is yours. The decision is yours. And that's what makes it valuable. You choose to give God all of your heart. You choose to make him your shepherd. And tonight, it's your night of salvation. I already know you know who he is in your head, but you haven't given him all of your heart. And tonight is your night. You say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I do that? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father, but if you deny me, I, I, I'll deny you. That's what Jesus said. So in a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. I'll go one, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up, and I'll see it. When you hear this sound, bang! Your hand goes up, and I'll see it. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. 
I want to give him all of my heart, give him all of my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, and denying my presence in hell. And I'll see your hand go up, and you can put it right back down. How easy is that? So simple. Your call, your choice. Who should raise their hand in a moment when I pop my hands together? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, make sure, I'm speaking to you. Today is your day of salvation. If you're one of those people that says, well, I prayed with Billy Graham on television or I prayed a prayer with, uh, uh, you know, at a Harvest Crusade, that's great. But did you follow up the prayer with all of your heart and with all of your life? Because, you know, there's no magical abracadabra formula you call a prayer, magical words that you repeat, that God says, oh, they said the right formula. I'll let them in heaven. S -s don't treat God like he's stupid. He watches your life that follows your heart to see if your prayer is real. He's not stupid. And tonight is your night of salvation all across this auditorium. You might say to me, wait a minute, Pastor, you want me to raise my hand? I'll be embarrassed if I raise my hand. I'll feel funny. I'll, it's weird. Yep, it is. People behind you might see you. People next to you that you came with might see you. Who cares? Isn't it better to be headed for heaven than to be in hell because you care more about what people think instead of what God sees? Come on. Tonight, it's your night of salvation. It's your call. I've done my job. I've told you the truth. Now it's your call. You know where you're at. You know you need to get right with God. God brought you in this place for this reason because it's your divine appointment with God. You've had a lot of appointments. Now you have a divine one with God tonight. You better give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. But nobody can make you do it. You've got to do it yourself. So I'm counting the three. Pop my hands together. It's your call. It's your choice. Are you ready? Here it is. One. Two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Thank you. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you. Seven. Thank you. Eight. Thank you. Nine. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. Thank you. Thirteen. Fourteen. Back in this family room. Fifteen. Back over here. Thank you. God bless you. There's fifteen wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? And knows you say, you might say to yourself, I know I need to, I see you back there in that one. Thank you, They're giving God all my heart, giving God all my life. Anybody else? There's 15 wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else? Let's give the Lord a great big praise for 15 wise people. <clears throat> all 15 of you, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, get your stuff. I want you to get out of your seat. I want you to bring your children out of the family room. I'm okay with that. Ushers, could you go back to that family room and help them get, to get up here? And here's what I want you to do. If you raise your hand, you're serious about God, get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, all your stuff, get your stuff, bring a friend if you need to get a friend. No one leaves during this time, period of time. Listen to me now, no one leaves. If you raise your hand, you're serious about God, I want you to get out of your seat, get in the aisle, meet me right here in front. You can do this in this safe, friendly place. If you're serious about God, let's stand and welcome the people. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Jesus, I believe. Come on, come on, come on. Jesus, I belong to you. You're the reason that I live. The reason that I breathe. Jesus, I believe. Come on, hope. Come on, hurry, hurry, hurry. Jesus, I belong. good and God good well all of you in front thank God you've come look over here to your left see this guy waving at you his name is Pastor Joel he's a really good guy no weird stuff goes on only takes a few moments he's going to pray with you number one legion of prayer because you need to invite Jesus into your heart okay because he doesn't come in because you need him he went to the cross and died for you because you need him now he comes in because he's a gentleman 
you've got to invite him, and that's what the prayer is all about. Second thing he's going to do is uh, give you some free information. Now that you're a Christian, what to do next? I mean, isn't that a great question? Now that you're going to get saved, most people think, I don't have to do anything. Oh, baloney, you're saved, but God wants you to live a certain kind of lifestyle. We want to help you to do that, which brings us to point number three, which is spiritual personal trainers. And you'll explain what that means in just a few minutes as friends. We give friends away here. Can you imagine that? That'll help you, pray for you during the week, meet you before church service, and encourage you to keep going forward with Jesus. Only takes a few moments. If you'll make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs>